the role of myth in eternity and the role of myth in the transfer of knowledge, which means the transmission of data, transmission of knowledge. <clears throat> if we look, and I've been looking a lot about the rise and fall of human empires and civilizations, governments, religions, countries, and parts of my searches, which led further back to how actually humanity, the human race evolved from hominids or whatever, and got into searching into paleontology about uh, whether we did come from Africa, whether humans did first arrive in Africa, how we became hominids, how we came down from the trees, how we lost our big stomachs like gorillas on four legs and stood up on two legs, whether we did both at the beginning, how our bone structure changed, how our food and the discovery of certain sciences or certain abilities like fire which meant cooked food, which meant uh, less running around, less big paunch bellies, uh, faster brain growth, which allowed us to think of new ideas. And it goes much further back. I've gone right back to the first single-celled organism and gone back to actually uh, biochemicals and enzymes and stuff, which we are now finding in places where we thought life could not exist after we found out that some microbes stuck to one of the space orbiters on the space station uh, actually survived when they came back to Earth. And so we found out life can exist in places where we thought it didn't. And what sparked life and the process of evolution, self-learning based on experience and based on trial and error and using chance as well uh, to experiment with something is evolving something is driving things to evolve with its own algorithm just like in artificial intelligence code we have algorithms that teach themselves to teach themselves and they just roll on their own and make their own um, constants and variables and rules based on self-learning and actually, I believe that the artificial intelligence algorithms use exactly the same building block method to evolve as nature uses in evolution. But this podcast is about myth. And you need to know about these things to understand what I'm going to say about myth. Because as things evolve, that means change. That means dinosaurs disappear. It means that human race appears. Mm. Monkeys don't disappear, they didn't disappear, but some became humans. If we're to believe the natural selection of Darwin, which of course many scientists will say exists, and I believe what Darwin explains as natural selection exists, but what scientists, most scientists who are atheists or who won't uh, allow God to come into this or some creator force, some conscious force, rule maker behind it, they say it's just chance. But I would say that um, natural selection, they try to say natural selection is supposed to insinuate accidental or random selection. I would not say that. I would say that when you furnish your room you might randomly move the furniture about and look at it from different angles and it's completely random there's no plan to it but the most efficient version will eventually arise through the through those random changes but the furniture isn't randomly just moving itself about and then arranges itself in what's perfect because what is perfect is based on a decision it's based on efficiency, and efficiency is based on need, the needs of the person involved with the things which are going to be efficient. And so there must be something wanting things to go a certain direction and to make those selective choices of what is more efficient for the evolution of the eye. The first single-celled organisms had a kind of a sensor 
where it's just new blurry light or brighter light. And so if the light went blurry, they knew there was an, they didn't know. It was just an automated reaction to flee the blurriness and seek the light because it was a first reaction to flee enemies. And it was the first purpose of the eye. But the eye then developed, it started to develop its iris and its closable lens, develop a lens and be able to see in 3D, first in 2D, then 3D, then color. And who knows where our eyes are going because we're now expanding the, the frequencies of light and color on computer screens. And evolution hasn't stopped. And we're using our eyes in lots of other ways. We're looking at smaller and smaller text on iPhones. We're going to develop zooming abilities. A few generations, we're going to need glasses. If we use glasses too much, then we will not develop the evolution. But evolution is based on need. And the need in the heart of the human is what makes the human evolve. And the need in the single microbe is what makes the need uh, that makes the eye of the single microbe evolve. Mm? But need is the mother of invention. Necessity is the mother of invention, yeah? Just like expectation is the mother of disappointment. And so there is a necessity there. A necessity for what? For who? There can't be just a necessity without anybody. A necessity implies a being or implies a consciousness that needs that necessity. And so evolution is a force, it's a candle flame that burns. And artificial intelligence also burns by its own candle now. It learns by itself, it's called machine learning or deep learning. And I think it follows the same principle because there is only within the laws of physics in the physical and immaterial and material universe there are only certain things you can do until we've gone multidimensional. For example, you have a plane. You have line and plane. So if you have two lines and three lines you can make a flat triangle that's a plane or a flat circle, a flat earth but it's completely flat, it has no depth. You need then another line <coughs> that is vertical in its opposite direction to make the third dimension. And after you've got line, of course, you can start making shapes. So you can take three flat triangles, put them together, yeah, and make a prism, or four, and make a pyramid. And then with square, triangle, yeah, and circle, which is the curve, because it's the um, inverse effect to the line. The line is straight, which is actually impossible. It's a hypothesis. And the curve is not straight, it's completely curved, which is also a hypothesis. And this is used in artificial intelligence too. It's used as, it's kind of like a, an opposed way of learning so it presents itself it argues with itself and seeks the right answer and makes a decision based on that and so through this inverse learning effect if i try this but what if i try that and like pit them against each other it's like putting two scientists with inverse theories against each other there is a saying in Freemasonry which says uh, two Masons may look at the same thing in completely different ways and see two completely different things. But the beauty of the matter is in the fact that they might both be right or that maybe they might both be wrong but that a higher truth might be discovered through the argument. And this is where quantum computing is going to help artificial intelligence algorithms. Algorithms. Here's an algorithm for you. You want to cross the stream. You think about code algorithms and you're not a programmer, you're going to be boggled. So think of it like this. Nature's algorithm of evolution, which is the same as AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning. You want to get across the stream. So you take a stone and throw it in within a jump level into the stream. You can jump on the stone, but you're still five meters away from the other side of the stream. 
so you think about it and you've learned from throwing a stone that you could get some distance you then conclude that you need more distance because you see what's missing so you think well if you're a human you'll think i'll get another stone if you're the computer you might if you're very developed you might think well there's five meters left i've gone one meter with this stone at an average of one meter per jump i need another four to five stones hmm. so you go back and get another stone and throw it yeah and jump on that stone when, when you've got another stone you jump on the second stone with the third stone you throw it another meter ahead of you yeah but you might have alternative thinking which machine learning i'd like to be involved in this because i don't know how much the algorithms are going to incorporate these things but a human would think well i've gone three meters now there happens to be a four meter long plank just over there on my side of the river bank i'm now going to take that four meter long plank and place it on the third stone and let it traverse the rest of the distance to the other bank of the stream and i won't have to get any more stones it's easier it's one lift one journey it's not heavier than three stones it's faster and you make all of these conclusions in an instant if you're clever some people would never think of it hmm? this depends on the person but this is evolutionary algorithm that when you are do the first bit you then see the second and third steps and it evolves but you cannot evolve until you have made the first mistake or the first good action and so when you every action you make is seen as a mistake or an action through judgment which i shall get into the process of judgment within the human mind and within nature's mind and within the mind of artificial intelligence of judging what is better what is more efficient what is preferable mm, all of these aspects are something i would love to um consult with the artificial intelligence community and the the most advanced developers about this because um nature's evolution and the evolution of artificial intelligence both work by algorithm and so we got across a stream with two possible algorithms either slowly stone by stone with the traditional method or we went made a quantum leap using quantum computing by making a simultaneous adverse um adverse or uh, um, parallel possible possibility alternative thinking lateral thinking we might have been able to laterally think of more than one possibility at the same time if we use just stones or the plank and the stones and calculate how many stones are needed before you can use the plank or if you use the plank with the stones yeah to use three stones and a plank so just make one stone and then throw another stone two three meters and use the plank to walk over to th to th and use the plank again you might only need two stones instead of three hmm. <clears throat> so that's three that's quantum computing will be able to think of various things at the same time and make billions of computations much faster than even the biggest supercomputer in the world today but the universe itself and nature's algorithm which involves constant change which is why the the buddha dhamma of the buddha what his first of the three marks of existence in his teachings was what scientists called entropy a sandcastle falls apart it doesn't build itself together an iceberg crumbles it does not form itself i'll argue that a bit in a bit but anyway that all things are impermanent is what the buddha said all things are in constant dissolution and slowly but surely will dissolve what i would argue is that they, you cannot destroy energy and so although it appears that humans view of a sandcastle we have a conditioned view to see that shape as a sandcastle because memory we've seen knights in armor movies and so that's the sandcastle falls apart and it goes from order into disorder that's what scientists say but actually if you watch a desert 
it never stays the same. It's completely changing. But you can't say it's not beautiful. The ripples on the sand dunes change all the time, but they're orderly. It is the force of chaos that is dissolving them and taking them apart and making them change. People like to say taking them apart and putting it back together again. Actually, it isn't because energy is just energy and it can't really be taken apart and put back together again. It can only seem to be. Which is why when we see the wooden table, the oak table with the oak legs and the oak chairs with the oak chair legs on the oak floor with the oak walls and the oak wooden ceiling. Your mind has the words oak, yeah? And your eyes have memory, vision, consciousness of what you are seeing and memory of what you have seen it and you know it's oak wood because you bought it once in a home pro store or some home store, DIY store, and they had oak and teak and you know what oak is and you've seen an oak tree so you've got all this oakiness in your mind. But if you look on a submolecular level, where the bottom surface of the chairs of the oak table seem to make contact with the surface of the planks of the oak floor. If you look at on a subparticle level, go down into the molecules and the atoms and the quarks, yeah, and you look at the protons and the neutrons and you try and count Measure the distance between the protons and neutrons within the aton atoms and the electrons and the spaces between them from the oak planks of the floor and the oak bottom surface of the chairs of the oak of the oak chairs, chair legs. You will see there is absolutely nothing separating them. There is the same distance between the molecules and the spaces between them and so it's just one big cloud of molecules this oak room with the oak table and oak chairs and oak plank floor and oak walls where does the floor become the wall where your mind says it does because you've been conditioned to see that as a wall this is a floor that is a table and these as chairs but on a subparticular level on a quantum level all there is, is no separation. There is just a complete cloud of particles with spaces between them. And each particle is composed of subparticles with spaces between them. And uh, even though we found the Higgs boson, which creates matter, that does not mean we have found the smallest particle because the Higgs boson is probably composed of other things. And it's probably just a combination of various other individual, seemingly individual particles, which when in combination are programmed to function to create a certain kind of energy that we call matter, which we can see, not dark matter, but visible matter. All with algorithms. The algorithms don't write themselves until the first algorithm has been written until the first code for the algorithm has been written. Artificial intelligence, machine learning programs now, their algorithms write themselves. And so does evolution writes itself, which is why scientists say that natural selection <coughs> runs automatically and that there's no God behind it. Which I don't like to talk about God, but let's say um, prime creator or a creative conscious energy, conscious something behind it all the candle flame and you know like who made the universe what happened before the big bang yeah and if God exists who made God all of that you have to get your head out of that you have to get your head out of that because time is also an illusion and so whatever it is that sends this creative force that builds upon itself as an algorithm and that after having been written within a few basic rules and laws of grammar, of cosmic grammar, set into motion an algorithm called Mother Nature, which cons scientists into believing there is no creator of it all. 
And so I began with the topic of myth. If we look at how everything, although energy changes, my body will become ash and part of the river and blah, blah. And one day maybe the particles will reform together into another body or another body will reform from par various particles of different parts of those things that were once other beings. That doesn't matter. It's just things transforming, transformation, all this the law of impermanence, all the entropy in quantum physics mechanics, they call it entropy, the law of entropy. And the Buddhists call it the law of impermanence, the th first mark of existence. I would call it the law of, tran of constant transformation. I would say the process of constant transformation, so there's nothing to worry about. And it's an algorithm that has been written Machine learning has been written by humans, but the algorithm which caused us to evolve into humans is also very similar to that which we have written because we are made in the image of that which wrote the first algorithm which made us evolve. And we are also evolving into creators of algorithms which will create things and we will create new consciousness, machine consciousness. And we will find that even though artificial intelligence is much faster and calculate and can conclude things much faster and more efficiently than humans with our human error, that humans have insights that might think to use the plank instead of the stones to cross the river or think of three different computations at once, which quantum computers will also do. But the wisdom and the insight and the spirituality of a human could help artificial intelligence in conjunction. So the algorithm of the natural algorithm of nature's algorithm in combination with artificial intelligence and robotics and cybernetics and virtual, uh, what do you call that, virtual reality and augmented reality will cause us humans to blend with technology and blend with artificial intelligence so that our brains will actually be in connection with a matrix, a worldwide web of information. And a person will walk towards you in a meeting, a business meeting, and you will be able to scan. And before they've reached you, you'll know what their name was, when you met them last, if you met them at all, if you had an appointment, what the topic was about, if any of their relatives have passed away recently, if they just got married, if it's his birthday or whatever, and you will be able to greet him, shake his hand, and fulfill all of your business requirements by wishing him happy birthday, congratulating him on the, on the marriage of his son to a famous um, model or whatever. And artificial intelligence will help us to zoom in our eyes will be able to zoom in. We will be able to have um, cybernetic irises and cybernetic eyes that can zoom in or look in infrared, have night vision, all sorts of things. Now, myths. Throughout these algorithms of change and evolution and things have been dis seeming to disappear. They haven't, they transformed. Yeah, Rome disappeared the empire of Rome. It did not disappear, it became Italy. Yeah? And we could say that uh, the Alexandrian empire disappeared. It didn't, it became a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. And Albion is no more because it became the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And some religions we don't know about and things, practices, anthropological, social and religious practices and we know nothing about because they were lost in the past. They're completely gone. Mm. And uh, so many things rise and fall. Empires rise and fall. Religions rise and disappear. Knowledge is gathered and lost. Cataclysms, I believe, have happened that have 
destroyed humanity and sent us back into the Stone Age and all knowledge was lost except for a few artifacts which these strange artifacts we find like a hammer inside a stone that's 10 million years old how the hell did that hammer get in there we must have had metal smelting 10 million years old which means humanity must have evolved until then this is how we have the myth of Atlantis because that was from before a cataclysm and so the things which survive are the myths. The religions die. The religions they had in Sumeria and Gilgamesh, the legend of Gil the, the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, oh, came long before the Bible. But it talks about two brothers who kill each one kills the other, like Cain and Abel in the Bible. It talks about uh, the deluge. The Great Flood, which is talked about in the Quran, in the Torah, and in the Holy the Christian Bible. And that before Gilgamesh there are other myths, and there are myths around the world, ancient, much more ancient than the Bible, all which mention the deluge, which mention twelve disciples or twelve gods or aliens who came from heaven. Or twelve great beings, and which mentioned dying on a tree, being born of a virgin, great deluges, and they exist in all these religions and myths and stories around the world. And so it seems that although religions change and come and go, these myths seem to survive throughout. And so all things are in transformation, or as a Buddhist would say, all things are impermanent, or as a quantum scientist would say, all things are subject to the law of entropy, are in constant dissolution. I would say they're in constant rearrangement. Everything is in constant rearrangement, which is part of natural selection. It's what natural selection is doing. It's the algorithm of life. It's nature's algorithm. And... Machine learning, the people who programmed DeepMind, Google's DeepMind, and the people who programmed various uh, machine learning, deep learning uh, algorithms do not know anymore how their, Facebook for example, they do not know how their AI, their artificial intelligence, is thinking or making decisions anymore, how it's writing its own algorithms. They don't know what it's basing it on, its decisions on they don't understand anymore it's going on its own but I would say it follows the same principle of building blocks of getting across a stream to the other side as nature uses to develop an eye an iris a lens to develop a system a brain a nervous system and to slowly evolve based on its own criteria be that efficiency, likability, necessity, and that all of those necessities and likabilities, you need not an individual, but you need a consciousness behind that to actually decide to say, what is ethical? What is unethical? What decision should be made in such a situation and why? Those are all based on views. And that's where it stops with me, because whatever writes nature's algorithm, whether it has views or not, whether it's a being or just a consciousness, <coughs> the algorithm has been written to run automatically on its own. And that evolution has not stopped. We are still evolving. And where humans are going to evolve to is a soon-to-be-spoken-about topic in one of my future podcasts. My last podcast was how in the hell did we get into this mess in the first place, which was beginning to talk about how humanity got into how it exists on this planet in the first place. This podcast is a continuation of that podcast. It's an intermediary. And the next podcast I'm making this series will be back directly talking about how we got into this mess in the first place. 
which will deal with the history of human civilization, how rule and governance arrived, uh, and how uh, we lost the self-sufficiency and became sufficient upon a state. And so the next podcast will be about that, to show how humans actually exist in a certain way, with a monetary system, an education system, a political government and rule and law system, which might not be the only alternative for life in this universe. I'm sure there are, if there is life around the universe, and there is, uh, that this planet is probably one of the few that uses a monetary system as its way of development. And that this is also one of the ways that nature's algorithm has programmed us to try out, but that a great cataclysm might mean that that this way isn't working and nature has decided that the algorithm has to try out a different variation because it's not working. And the end of the podcast series is going to come to hopefully explain why it's not working, why it's not the only way we can exist with money and education and schools and military service and wars in different countries and actually playing games with each other. Like China just rose their prices for American import products because Donald Trump said he's not going to help China in this and that. They're just like bullies, mafias bullying each other. And so... um. Does the world have to exist like this? Can humanity exist in utopia without government, governments, without sinners, without thieves and criminals and without police? Because with no crime, the police would be out of a, out of a job. Yeah, and the Ministry of Law and Enforcement would be out of a job and they wouldn't have any money coming in for that. But that's a matter for another talk, which is about economics and how that runs the world because you need to understand every part of the jigsaw puzzle. And this is, I believe, part three of how we got into this mess. And a podcast series about a lot of things. It goes all over the place, Uh, like all the different numbers around the edge of a roulette table, but only when you understand each number Can you see the hub of it, what's in the center, and what makes the world go around? People say money makes the world go around. People say that politics makes it go around, law makes it go around, governments make it go around, nature makes it go around. I would say evolution makes things happen and things keep changing. Constant transformation and natural selection is just part of that constant transformation but with economics there's also within the evolutionary process and we have come to a point where we have to ask ourselves is economics the only way that we can live as a society you look at an ant's nest or a termite's nest or a flock of birds and see what kind of economics they need to exist in harmony they don't at all they don't possess sciences although some of them can use a sticks and stuff to make nests with or to get insects out of a tree and animals do use tools but we have opposing thumbs and we can make tools and we have large brains and we can think complex thoughts and make technologies but that doesn't mean we've escaped evolution not at all and so i'd like to ask the question is economics a monetary system and an education system with subsequent application for employment instead of being your own boss or your own self-provider autonomously is that the only system that exists and does that system exist on every planet of living beings around the universe or are we one of the strange places that uses a monetary system and has different countries who mess around with each other and play games with each other and make economical wars with each other which is a cold war china won't sell tungsten carbide which we need for airplane wings and we need for drilling instruments and they own 80 percent of the tungsten carbide in the world they stopped selling it to anyone except themselves in 2010 that's a stranglehold on other countries it's not nice and it's only what misbehaving evil people do these are governments 
Do we need governments, economics, police forces and armies? Well, in the moment we do because people have harmfulness and thievery in their hearts. And that's why the answer is not to change the system or to vote somebody else in or to create a single world government, rather to purify the hearts of all humanity so we don't need a police force or a justice system or a set of laws because our laws will be natural laws within ourselves and our instincts will not have those defilements within them. And in Buddhism they have a prophecy and I'm sure most religions do, uh, most myths do, which is what this started about is that uh, in the time of Maitreya, the fifth enlightened being, everybody is a stream enterer, so everybody is pure. And there is no need for a police force or anything anymore, because nobody even thinks of stealing anything or harming somebody. And so there you go. I wish to pose the question, is the system of human civilization we have in the moment the only solution? Because if it is, the utopia we see in this picture here will never be possible. That's only possible without a police force and an army and without people doing things that needs the police force and the army to come. And so if you wish for a utopia, begin with yourself and hope that everybody else does the same. It will happen, not in your lifetime or mine, but we're part of the change that's going on now. And this talk is part of the many talks and many things which will cause people to think about things and slowly change and teach their children. And in about 500 years from now, we will see that utopia. And this is my prophecy. And this is in truth, of course, also nature's algorithm, which has been programmed in within creation, or what humans call creation, and it is our destiny, as humans imagine the, con the abstract imaginary concept of destiny. Destiny is actually, what it means is the future effects of the currently being created causes, in which these causes are actions being made by evolution the process of building upon itself, self deep learning. Natural evolution uses deep learning and artificial intelligence uses deep learning. And what we are about to become, because evolution has not stopped, will leave the monetary system behind, will leave different countries and politics and different races and nations behind and we will become a planetary nation. There will be a short phase where the colonists on Mars will declare independence and will have wars again, but eventually we will lose that planetary... We will change from national consciousness to planetary consciousness, and then we'll still have the separation in our minds a little bit. And when we live on many, many worlds, we will then stop our wars and realize that we have galactic or cosmic universal consciousness and that we are all one. Because if there were no countries, no religions, no politics, no impurity, no thieving hearts, no killing hearts, no lying hearts, no perverted hearts, there would be no police force, there would be no politicians, there would be self-governance, there would be collaboration between the mutual geniuses. Everybody will have their genius. Be you a stonemason, be you an abstract thinker like myself, an idea monger, a wordsmith, a poet, an architect, an artist, a tech freak, very good at code, somebody who is good with imagination, somebody who is good at management, Everybody will do what they feel they wish to do according to their natural instinct and we will become what we are meant to be and what evolution or Mother Nature has in store for us. Well, if you look at what's happened since the Big Bang till now and look at every species on every planet on Earth and everywhere else in the universe, 
you will see that we will never stop becoming something different. And what the future holds for us is not only that we will melt with machines and that we will blend with artificial intelligence, but that we will also move on to higher vibrations and other dimensions. And that apart from heaven on earth, in a utopian Maitrean society, with pure-hearted people, no money system, no education where they take your children away from you to educate them and indoctrinate them with the state education, instead of letting each person educate himself. I've educated myself on the internet more than I ever educated myself in public school or universities. And there are other dimensions we will go to, and what we now call ourselves as human. Well, in a million years we won't look like that. <clears throat> Even in 50 years we will start to have changed so much that how you know the world now, you might not be able to accept it. You'll need to be born again for reconditioning because it will be too much for you. It won't be the world you knew you were born into. That's how fast technology is changing. And the algorithm of nature continues. And artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, which scientists and developers are scratching their heads about, and politicians and lawmakers and great idea mongers such as Elon Musk, are coming out with statements and the debate about the dangers, benefits and disadvantages of artificial intelligence and if we should blend with it as humans and how this will affect human evolution in the future is something we should all know about and think about. And so I would like to wish you all that you reach your ascension and destroy your pre-assumptions and conditioning and find your center and see the geometry of everything within nature's algorithm and return back into tune with this algorithm and reach your ascension through your inner meditation and through purification so that the world we speak of, which some people call utopia, may actually become a reality without money, governments, guns, military, police forces, rule and governance and punishment. Let's remove the need. With no demand, there will be no supply. May you reach your ascension and rise up to higher dimensions of existence as swiftly as possible. <laughs>